All right, welcome to the August 12th, 2024 Anon Creds Working Group meeting, the post-Olympic session. Got a few things to talk about today. Um, I'm gonna bring some updates to the group about the um, proposed scheme for unlinkabilities with CKP using hardware-based holder keys. Um, we have to discuss the Anon Creds Project Charter, which is boring, but I'll think I've got it all planned out based on work I've done on the Aries project and the uh, Indy project. So it shouldn't be too painful. Um, and then um, we'll do this first, actually, project status updates um, on things like auditing, the revocation manager, and so on. So I'll move that up. And we'll go from there. Um, reminder that we're recording this, so people are hearing things. This time is wrong. I got to fix this time. Uh, oops. And um, this is a Linux Foundation, Hyperledger Foundation meeting, so we have to announced that the antitrust policy for Linux Foundation is in effect, as is the Hyperledger Code of Conduct. So keep those things in mind. All right. Any introductions or uh, other topics, agenda items that people would like to discuss today? Um, I can give you an update on the post-quantum version of the of Allosaur, if you want if if we have time yeah yeah i'm sure that'll be awesome fascinating okay um so recall i think everyone was here for this discussion or most people were here for the discussion that um uh a bunch of cryptog cryptographers got together to <coughs> talk about the European architecture reference framework for the EUDI, um, EUI digital identity in the, in the wallet, basically said the planned approach of using um, multi-issuance is a bad idea. Uh, multi Issuing um, many copies of a credential where each um, credential is bound to a different hardware key and each credential is used only once or at least used with only one verifier is a bad approach. Um, and that they should use BBS signatures to achieve the unlinkability goal. Um, they then heard from the EU basically saying, we have to have this bound to a hardware key, the ARF, um, requires that each credential be bound to a hardware key um, from the holder. And so a project that was in flight from various people, including Google, um, was talked about as a possibility. So instead of using BBS signatures, uh, a signature scheme based on ECDSA was proposed. Um, so now there is the start of an academic paper, and that's what this link is here um, for those that are interested. Um, and it's based on this work here. Um, Mike, are you familiar with this? Uh, no, I'll Ligero. take a look at Oh, I thought no. that. For some reason, I thought that was a well-known. Okay, so anyway, so this is a 2017 paper. It's published, uh, it's an ACM paper. So link is there. Um, and then the start of the paper on how to use it for verifiable credentials is there. Uh, let me save that and um, Put this into I'll put the link of the meeting into chat so people can grab those papers. So the one, the first one is completely unpublished. It's got no names on it, um, but it's been started. I'm pretty sure um, Abi 
um, started it. Um, but it's, you know, early days on that one. Um, must, uh, the basic status is it's got to go through all the academic reg uh, rigor and then through standardization. Um, Digital Bazaar doesn't like it because it lacks a pseudonymous identifier for the credential. Um, so that even though you get unlinkability, what you don't get is any um, actual tie to the credential. So, so they're very much very high on this feature of BBS signatures of using this feature, which is that a verifier with a single credential that, that is issued to the holder, the holder presents the credential, uh, a derivation of the credential to the verifier, and that verifier gets a consistent identifier for the credential so that they recognize when that, when that credential is used multiple times. And the reason I believe they are Hung up on this. This is this, actually the exact same complaint they had about a non creds back in 2017 was because they see it that a holder can be a proxy to a to a service that responds to the to the credential request. And because that proxy does not um, provide any link to the credential they're using, they could reuse it many, many times without it ever being detected by the verifier. So um, the wallets then turn into proxies to services that provide fake ID IDs for people. That's their objection. So the use of a pseudonymous identifier is is crucial to them so that they can see, so that a verifier would see a pattern when, it, when the same credential is used over and over. I don't know how legit that is, but there you go. Um, what is being pushed by the group that um, met last week was the thing holding up BBS is a review by cryptographers that has not happened uh, to the extent that um, IETF is happy. So IETF has reviewed the BBS work and is and the only thing holding them up is a is from from standardizing it is supposedly a review by cryptographers. So the push came out certainly from the people on the call, like Digital Bazaar, was to say, let's get that done instead of doing this ECDSA thing. It doesn't get hardware based um, credentials, but they'd rather see it go with that plus um, plus a dual signature where you get a, 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 for lack of a better term, a non-fancy um, CKP-based ECDSA signature. You just get a straight signature across the data. And so when you have to use a ACDSA key, a hardware key, you use that. Otherwise, you use the BBS signature. So that's the status update. Mike, I am interested in you. Yeah, I mean, you you might be interested, whatever you, you want to do, is take a look at these two things. Um, Ligero as the core algorithm, and then this paper as using it for, um, for binding it to a hardware-based key. Um, there will be lots more conversations on this over the next few weeks. Um, so i um, happy to keep people updated or um, get people involved in any of those that they want to want to be involved with. Hey, Stephen, quick, uh, quick question. Uh, it says their proposal from Google using ZKP. So is Google researching zero knowledge proofs right now? Oh, yeah. 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 I will yeah. So evidently they've been working on this for some time. And Mike knows Abby, who is at Northeastern University, who is involved in that project. And what's their relationship with Hyperledger? Um, none. Okay. So, yeah. like, um, is it seen as like a competitor or just like potential partner or unsure? Yeah, I mean, I I think the goal is to work together on this and try to see how how quickly we can get things done so that we avoid going with linkable 
or or going with this idea of um, batch issuing of credentials. I know Apple's working on one too. Mm -hmm. That's from my sources inside the Apple Kremlin, as I call it. You know, you're not allowed to know anything about Apple unless you work there. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Anyway, but, but cool. they're doing one based on just standard cryptography. And so anyway, we'll see which one kind of wins out. I've got some work I'm doing with the post quantum stuff, which is actually surprisingly yielded some techniques we could probably use with standard cryptographic techniques. Um, Interesting. That looks a little promising. So, well, let's, um, okay. Well, there we are with that. Um, this is this is an interesting push. This is kind of something I've always had struggled with is when something new comes along that looks useful, how do you get a cryptographer in the academic world interested in um, looking at it? Um, what's their motivation to look at it? And that's been a struggle for a while. So we'll see. Um, Victor. Wanted to jump to this now, which is the work you're doing on the Allosaur project. Yeah, yeah. Hey guys, uh, I'm working on the revocation manager for Allosaur. Yeah. Um, currently, I've I almost finished the uh, the conversion of server side, uh, server side in in the FFI support, and uh, however, I was stuck in one of the error, which I would like to discuss with Mike, like after the meeting, and uh, yeah. I was also looking into the Python side as well. I'm converting the structures in in um in Rust to Python now. Yeah, and uh, I was also writing some tests to see if it is working properly. Okay. Yeah, that's that yeah. is all I've got. Okay. Um, you and Mike, uh, Mike, do you want to put together a, a schedule? I know you said you were super busy, but it'd be good and and. This meeting may not take the full time, so maybe you could do it after. I could, yeah. If this meeting doesn't take the full time, I'll have time. Like today, I'm swamped. Tomorrow, I actually have some more time, and Wednesday, I have time as well. Okay. So. Well, let's see if um, I think this meeting will finish early based on the progress, <laughs> the the conversation. So um, chances are you can use this time. Great. Um, great. BBS signatures, I think I've given the updates on that. It continues to um, be talked about in, um, in uh, you know, and pushed in W3C, for instance, the BBS via BCDI. Um, and so we'll see where that goes and, and you know, back to that. Um, Mike, you said you were busy in audit land. Um, is that involving any of the Agora work? Yes, the verifiable secret sharing, that audit just finished. And no significant findings, but I'm just re-arcing a few things, clarifying some right. things that Kodolsky flagged. So okay. among some other audits, which is causing some ripple effects, like now I have to go back and touch the Gennaro one. Okay. Um, and then I'll just bundle those both together to go to Agora. Okay. Um, but anyway, yeah, Blissful's already there, so yeah, um, it shouldn't touch that one at all. Yeah, and then of course, because of all that, it's having ripple effects on the BBS library I was about to contribute to Agora. So <laughs> anyway, just lots of ripple effects. So anyway, that's it from that part. Okay. Threshold MPC, any update on that? Um, I'm trying to think what that was. Like, you're talking about the DKG, or are you talking about threshold signing? Uh, I must say, I, I, I don't know what this is, but I typed it in one day when you you were talking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I have a whole bunch of threshold stuff that I'm doing, like, um. For Allosaur, I'm adding the MPC stuff. Maybe that's what it was. Okay. All right, I'll take this off for now. Mostly the beaver triples because that's what it relies on. And it's a little gnarly. Not 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 like in terms of like cryptography, but just in terms of like the steps that you have to do. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, in terms of the non credits charter, this isn't too exciting, but I do need to report it and make sure that this is understood by the community and go. So, um, announcement uh, of an intent to form the uh, Linux Foundation Decentralized Trust, LFDT, and that um, Hyperledger would would come under the LF Decentralized Trust. And as a result of that, each project within Hyperledger sort of, um, uh, instead of using the Hyperledger um, Technical Oversight Committee and the, the Hyperledger Charter, each project would get their own Technical Steering Committee, TSC, and their own charter. And as a result of that, every um, project has a charter that looks something like this. Um, so it's a legal document that is the technical charter for an on creds and, and goes into it. So one of the things we were asked to as a project is to review that, decide how we would have a technical steering committee, how we would have manage maintainers, how maintainers relate to technical, um, uh, the TSC and the processes involved in that. So after some discussion in all three in this group in Indy and in Aries, we came up with the following plan. Um, create an, an on-creds repo that is similar to this repo in Aries, which just basically has the license um, and a few other files and a readme that sort of introduces the project. So we don't have one of those in an on-cred, so creating that should is pretty straightforward. Within that, we put a tsc.md file, and this is the file that lists the current TSC members and the processes. So membership as a TSC does not imply any... Um, GitHub permissions, which is what people think of, um, but rather just says you are a TSC member and you follow the processes. Um, I realize I'm missing a link shoot um, that I should have in here. So hang on one sec. Um, sorry about this. Okay, put a TSC that lists the TSC members and the processes related to that. So that looks something like this. It says, here's the list. Here are the duties. Here's how you become a TSC member. Here's how you re remove a TSC members. And, and these are based very uh, it, quite similar to the processes for for how maintainers were defined, but maintainers was always difficult because maintainers are not across the project; they are specific to each repo, and so it gets kind of mushy. So this very much separates out um, maintainers being those with escalated GitHub privileges from. TSC members who simply vote on and oversee and steer the project itself. So there's a TSC file, there's a maintainers file. So the maintainers file is the thing that points to anyone who has escalated privilege, GitHub privileges in the project and the processes for um, becoming a maintainer. So again, we have a, an example of this in the ARIES repository. So it points to this access control YAML file, and I'll talk about that in a moment, lists the duties of a maintainer, how to become a maintainer, and how to remove maintainers, and the process for doing that. So this is the overall maintainers file for the entire project, the entire non-creds project. 
and it will go into the um, Hyperledger and non-creds repository. And then finally, within each repository will be a maintainers.md file in each repository that points to the access control YAML file, which lists who has escalated GitHub privileges within this repository, within each repository, and then points to this maintainers file to say, here's the duties and requirements. And again, shoot, I should have had a, a link in there. So all this file becomes, the maintainers file, basically becomes a, a little paragraph saying, all of the information needed here is pointing to somewhere else. And um, the, the actual list of people with excel, escalated privileges is in this access control.yaml and the duties are in this maintainer, this common maintainers file for the whole project. Um, for those not aware, access control.yaml is a hyperledger governance file. This contains a list of all of the teams and then um, what privileges they have on those teams. And then coming down to the bottom of that, and this is across all of Hyperledger. And then there is each repository, and each repository has a set of teams on it. So that basically is how all of the GitHub permissions are managed within Hyperledger. So if I wanted to make, you know, Victor a maintainer in, in a certain repository, I would do a PR to this file that would get merged or get approved, get merged. And he now has these magic um, GitHub privileges. What I'm hoping eventually will happen is instead of us pointing to the access control.yaml, there will be a file generated from that access control that has the literal list of maintainers for each repo. But somebody's got to write that code and it hasn't happened yet. So I'm expecting it to happen because all it is is some YAML processing. And then finally, the last step is to update the charter to match roughly what is in the Aries charter. And this is the, the link that I was missing. Aries project. Yeah, I don't have the link to it right now. Anyway, I'll put the link in there, but it is an update to this, this section that basically describes what I said, that there will be a TSC file in a certain locase, location and that, um, and there'll be a maintainers file and here's, and the rules for becoming a TSC member and the rules for becoming a maintainer will be defined here. I have done my duty to describe this to everyone. I apologize for this um, bit of administration that we have to go through, but uh, welcome any comments, suggestions, objections to this approach. And if not, I will uh, do that work that's necessary, create the repositories, update this file and share it with David Boswell. The um, maintainers, the, the actual names that will go in the TSC will become whoever is a maintainer on the repositories in the Anoncreds project today. So those will become the TSC members. So from a governance standpoint, is it much different than what we have now? It is it is different in that Anoncreds previously only worried about doing technical work and now there's some administrative overhead. There's this document that we've never had before that is a legal document that that sets forth how the Anoncreds project works versus simply inheriting all of that administration from Hyperledger. That's the difference. Can't we just punt it all to Sean? I mean, I'm sure he'd be happy to have more on his work, you know, workload, Thanks, right? Mike. You're the best. Really appreciate it, buddy. Yeah. Um, one other thing that I should raise that that people want to that 
people that worry that know about the the Aries project is there there will be a discussion this Wednesday at the Aries working group meeting uh, about moving Aries various Aries project at least Akapai into OWF um, into the Open Wallet Foundation. So following um, because the status quo doesn't really apply anymore. Hyperledger is is sort of um, becoming more you know, all the projects are sort of running themselves now instead of using Hyperledger as the as the the grouping. Um, the LFDT is a possible grouping, but but given we have to change at some you know out of uh, into at least LFDT, um, the expectation is um, certainly what what our team is pushing for is to move at least Akapai over to um, Open Wallet Foundation. That discussion will happen this coming Wednesday. And um, so hoping those, anyone interested in the ARIES project can join that meeting. So administration over with. Sean, anything more to add? Uh, no, that was a, a great overview, Stephen. Thank you um, for the folks on the call. One of the main goals and objectives of this project formation work, specifically the charters, is to make governance more transparent. So whether it's someone who's already in the community or someone new, like, hey, is this a project I want to get involved with? They're able to understand what, what governance means, and it's consistent across Linux Foundation projects. So uh, thank you, Stephen. That was a great breakdown for everybody. I appreciate yeah. it. All right, um, Mike, you wanted to talk about PQ efforts. Yeah, so obviously I've been doing some uh, PQ efforts for an equivalent of Alistor, which is basically a very fast revocation, you know, virtually unlimited set membership, but keeping it fast and scalable. So in researching this, we kind of discovered there might be a way I need to code it up and test it to do very fast set membership, use it with any elliptic curve. The reason that came up is because we were trying it with lattices and then we said, hey, this technique's pretty general. We could probably even do it with elliptic curves and that works too. Just by modifying bulletproofs a little bit from its current state. So uh anyway it should be really fast and um the idea is that we can do two to the 38 members you know so it's like 256 billion um test if a member is in that set in less than a second using this assumption which means we wouldn't need pairing friendly curves to do it anymore we could just use any elliptic curve and the assumptions are pretty simple. It's based on, can we reduce a polynomial anymore? <laughs> Which is a simple mathematical uh, problem. So that's kind of cool. Two so, to the 38th? Yep. So and the downside no is, yeah, you have to pre-allocate it, right? But you can just represent each thing as a single bit. But it we would have to be pre-allocated versus Allosaur is more dynamic. You don't have to pre-allocate anything. So... There's, how, there's how trade is, so how big is the data object? Two well, you have two to the 38 bits. <laughs> so divide that by eight and you got two to the, what, 36 bytes. So if if you wanted to go that high, you don't have to go that high. Oh, you I just see. say two to the 30th, right? We're just saying there might there might be a way to go as high as that and still be a reasonable time. Oh, okay. Like less than a second to generate the proof and less than a second to verify it. Okay. So we'll have to see when I code it up and try it. So does that mean you could have a million and still have the same properties? A million? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it just becomes like herd immunity problem at that point. Okay. Are you one of the million? Are you one of the billion? Kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So to me, two to the 38 is like, you know, <laughs> a reasonable number for like IoT devices. Yeah. 
I mean, a trillion, it's like kind of pushing it. So anyway, yeah. Yeah. so we said if we can hit that as our upper limit and say if we can do that in less than a second, then we're good. So what we're trying to figure out is can we do it in the threshold manner like Alistair can? So that's the other thing is <laughs> this can't, but for issuance, but for proving and verifying, you don't need threshold. So, but for proving and verifying, that was one of the biggest problems we saw when I was looking up snarks for with Merkle tree approach. This approach doesn't need that. So there's no setup costs or anything like that other than pre-allocating. And it would transfer to PQ, which would be really nice. Yeah. So kind and... of along the lines of can we can we do, you know, the was it the EU DI? Yeah. Uh, with just standard cryptography, this might be a possible revocation mechanism for that. Mike or Steve? Um, yeah, I got a question for Mike um, about PQ. Um, in the US, at least, um, the post quantum algorithms and procedures and stuff are being, being defined, and there's been some algorithms chosen. Um, I understand like blissful is, um, post quantum safe or secure, whatever the term no, is. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. <laughs> okay. No. So when it's we're based talking... on pairings, which is not post quantum secure. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought I read that it was, but it, it had never been submitted to the, to the, um, evaluation contest, uh, process. No. So when yeah, we say, nope. yeah, when we say we're making these post quantum secure, are people to understand that for U.S. government interaction purposes, they're post quantum secure, or they're just technologically post quantum secure? Uh, mathematically post quantum secure. Okay. So, like, for example, dilithium is one method that's been approved by NIST, which is based on ring learning with errors. Mm -hmm. And so when we say we're trying to do the same thing, that's the same assumption that dilithium uses for this method. So that's when we say we're trying to go post-quantum. We're trying to base it on the same assumptions and math problems that have been, they're being used for currently approved NIST algorithms. Does that help? Yeah, my yeah, my concern is is not technology or math. Um, the, um, there's a lot of things that are secure that haven't been submitted and approved by NEST. But are as at some point are we going to have a uh, post quantum NEST approved version of like a non creds and others? Well, that's my goal. I'm trying to get ahead of the curve. <laughs> um, like to me, the last problem I had was revocation and Alasor fixes all the problems I had. Mm -hmm. And so to me, you know, the next great adventure is, can I do the same things we're doing in a non crads with post quantum based algorithms? Well, and then can I do it in a threshold post quantum algorithm? <laughs> and if I can do that, then the last thing is binding it to hardware, but I think that won't be too complicated because other people are also working on that right now. So I'm kind of doing a parallel effort. Okay, so when we when we get done down the road, however long this this takes, and uh, the Anon Cred group says um, this version is is post quantum secure. Will will it be the NIST secure variation, or will it be? Um, will we have to label it that this is, you know, using other standards, or this is using NIST standards? I, I just I'm wondering. We can label it as it's using NIST standards, but I wouldn't say it's NIST approved. <laughs> well, any more than okay. some of, like say bulletproofs that uses NIST approved algorithms, but bulletproofs yeah. is not NIST approved. If that makes sense. Yeah. Totally. That's. But, that's going to be totally the problem, Steve. And that's where we are already today is, you know, we're using things that are NIST approved, but in ways that aren't and have to be verified and so on. 
Yeah, I think that's that's okay. Um, I I think starting, you know, making sure that we're using post quantum in a way that people under understand would be at least the base algorithms would be NIST approved or not NIST approved. Um, so yeah, this was a question on compliance, not on not on math or technology. Yeah, so I mean, like you can kind of see the evolution of non creds, right? Non creds one was more of a proof of concept. Can we even do this? Then we learned from the mistakes and said, well, we're too bound to specific algorithms that might be slow or problematic and don't scale. So I fix that with a non creds too. And by saying, well, let's make all the components so we can hot swap them as needed. So, you know, mix and match your signatures, your revocations and your other methods of proving things like that doesn't matter. Then once that was taken care of, then I said, okay, now the last problems are really, how do we do scalable revocation? Because we've got some scalable signatures and mostly scalable predicates. But predicates aren't used as much as revocation and the signature checking are. Now that we've solved that, that's when I'm like, okay, now I'm going to go to post-quantum. Can I hot swap a post-quantum algorithm in and see if I can do that? If I can do that, then I'll thresholdize it. Once I've done that, then, you know, let's bind it to hardware. So but I think there's a dual track. And so I only have so many cycles to give. And it sounds like to me, people are already working on the hardware. And so if I can say, here's the method you should use. Yeah. And it translates to even when you have hardware, then I think we're okay. Um, this work you're doing. So this set membership approach, does it, is, is the rest of the Allosaur um sort of interactions the same in other words the role That's of the, the revocation manager is the same as it is today the data yep. that flows between the issuer and the revocation manager is the same as today yeah that's the goal like okay. once we've got kind of the overall arc then architecture then we have we just swap the cryptography itself right okay i mean the cool thing about cryptography is it turns all security problems into a key management problem. Yeah, <laughs> and that's where yeah. threshold comes in. Yeah. So once we've kind of got the business logic layer, which is what the architecture that you just described is, yeah. once that's yeah. in place, then you can hot swap the cryptography. At that point, then it just becomes key management. So yeah. Yeah. Cool. Fascinating. Um when you say so. Describe what you've done so far in the timeline and, and what you're thinking about um, for, so, for future, okay. for next steps. <laughs> next steps for me are to write up some test code to see if this works with the yeah. like Bitcoin yeah. curve and the NIST uh, 256 bit curve. Okay. See how long it takes if I do 2 to the 38 with a set membership using this modified uh, bulletproof. And when I say modified, it's not heavily modified. It's just like... 85% the same, but this 15% difference, you know, would have to be that then if that, if we can prove, yes, it works, it's totally reasonable to do it this way, then we'll write the security proof for it and publish. Yeah. When you say then two go to, to the threshold eyes, that model, two to mm -hmm. 38 memberships, and you've got to pre allocate them, does that mean so? I mean, a, I guess you could grow it, but uh, you'd probably start at two to the 20, right? One in a million. And eventually, but here's the other thing. This is the other problem with Merkle trees because it is based on a Merkle tree approach. Yeah. You can't ever remove anything. <laughs> well, I mean, you can revoke, but you can't delete a, an index if that makes sense. Because as soon as you yeah. mark an index is used, if you ever like give it to somebody else who's valid, then whoever got it revoked is now valid again. Yeah, um, but that's, I mean, if you've got two to 38, that does. So does that mean you have to generate two to the whatever, two to the 38 large numbers as as the <laughs> index member? No, it's just a single bit. But also remember, because if you say, I'm going to start out as everything is issued by default. Yeah. Then 
the base layer hashes are all the same and as you go up the tree. So it actually is very fast to compute. Yeah. But that's what you would do, right? Everything you would yep. allocate all of them as, as you would, or you would create them as all issued. You would issue them over time and then revoke them. Yeah. So you just set them all to zero to say it's not revoked. One yep. means revoked. Zero means not revoked. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. And that's it. And that's it. So, and then generating the proof. And then can we do even faster if we do, see, this is with a binary tree. What happens when we do a four area or an eight area tree? Okay. But, okay. I got to ask one more. Are, does the, does the holder get issued just an index or do they get issued a, some sort yep. of element? Nope. Just an index. Just an index. Holy crap. That seems way better. Well, like I said, there's there's trade-offs <laughs> with Thalassor, right? Like so far, yeah. I can't think of a way to do this in a threshold way. Okay. So I got to come up with that. And updates involve downloading parts of the tree, you know, depending on how big you want to hide yourself, right? If you want to say, if you download the whole tree, then nobody knows other than you're a member of the tree. But if you say, just give me the left half, then people know, oh, your index is in the left half. But if you've got two to the 38, then the left half of the tree is two to the 37. <laughs> right. So exactly. That's what I'm thinking is if you've, you know, if you're issuing 4 million credentials and you have a revocation registry that's a billion, It's yeah. not going to be, how big would a, a billion members be? Well, that's two to the 30th, right? Well, that's two to the 30th. So you're talking like two to the 28 file size. So 256 megabytes. Oh, okay. And the, and the holder has to download that? Um, well, they have, when they do an update, right, they need to download part the parts of their tree that changed. Mm -hmm. So... If they just ask for the part that changed, that's probably okay, you know, because like, let's say the issuer just says, oh, I'm just going to update this one segment, whether that was updating it from zeros to ones or ones to zeros, whatever the case may be, right? So mm -hmm. everybody should update it. Anyway, it, there's there's strategies to try and hide yourself and how you update. That's where it gets a little gnarly. Unlike with Allosaur, it's like, I'm just going to hide my element and tell you, give me an update. And that's yeah. it. Right? Yeah. So it's a little more complicated. Um, but it seems like the assumptions will work. And like I said, we were initially doing it for lattice based approaches, then found well, it's generic enough, it might even work for elliptic curves. And so we said, all right, we'll pause the lattice for a moment, try that. And so far, yes, it's working. And then if that works, then we can go to threshold based. Okay. So cool. Fascinating. Interesting discussion. So to me, it, it comes off as like a viable alternative to all the source. So to me, you could do both, right? You could yeah. say, hey, here's two privacy preserving revocation techniques. You yeah. know, pick the one that works for you. Um, do you have an overview of the architecture, as you put it, that here's what the holder does, here's what the revocation manager does, here's what the... Verifier. For this other approach? Yeah. Uh, not yet. Okay. I, I'd be super interested in that. You know okay. me. Well, That's well, all yeah. what I'm interested in. <laughs> well, once I do a proof of concept to prove that this even works. Okay. You know, in a reasonable amount of time, right? It'll work, but is it fast enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. It's easy to say, oh, yeah, it'll work. But if it takes 30 seconds to do a revocation proof generation, to me, that's not... Feasible. Exactly. And if it takes, if it always requires a 256 meg download every time you create a proof, that's not going to work either. Correct. Yeah. Because yeah. you're back to the tails file problem. Yeah. So. Exactly. You're back to the tails file problem. Yeah. Okay. Sounds awesome. Um, looks like we're not going to have a lot of time for you and Victor. Can you two, um, we'll yep, wrap I'll up sync this with him offline and then coordinate. Any other topics anyone wanted to raise? Steve, right. I frequently asked, like, 
for your slides. Is there any way you can, whenever you do a presentation on this stuff, um, can you link your slides somewhere if you're you able bet. to share those? Yeah, always. Um, you, the vast majority are actually in, I put them in here if I haven't already. So um, that's where they'd be. If there's any specifics you want to know, let me know and I can shoot them to you. Well, I mean, this looks like the meeting notes, but like, is there like a general place that just says all talks given based on oh, the year or idea. maybe yeah. the location? You know, it's just kind yeah. of one central landing page. That would yeah. be good. Okay. Um, I could probably create that. So I'll think about it. I'll put it on my to-do list. How about that? Okay, great. Awesome. All right. Thanks all. And we'll wrap up at this point. Um, you and Victor, Mike and Victor, stick around. I'm going to leave, but you guys can stick around and, uh, oh, no, I'm not. I got to leave. Okay, just do it on, do it on. I'll just uh, do it on Discord. I'll do, do it on, on Discord. Discord. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.